So hello everybody. I think that we can start. So hello everyone. My name is Remigiusz Marciniak and I will be your host for the next three speeches. I have a lot of info for you, so I have my papers to help me. So first of all, I hope that you enjoyed your lunch. The second one is that please put your phones in silent mode in order not to interrupt the, the speaker. And there will be Q&A session after the presentation, so please keep that in mind. Um, this is the ninth edition of Code Life, so we are really happy that we are back after two years of pandemia. And uh, this is a hybrid mode, so we also have a stream on YouTube, and the links are in Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page. And we have uh, in room number eight, as far as I know, yes, we ha you can play retro games there, so if you want, please go there. And uh, we have two companies uh, with plenty of interesting books, which is PWN and Helion, so please keep that in mind. And another really important information is that there will be an after party in Continuatia in, in city center at uh, 8.30 p.m. Um, of course, you can get hot beverages in three places here, so these are the main information, I think. And I think that we can start with our presentations. So, firstly, we have um, Kamil Vitecki, and it is my pleasure to introduce Kamil Vitecki. He's a positive, friendly, and outgoing person. In his free time, he bakes and also watches B-class movies, which is really interesting. He worked for Nokia for over a decade, and lately he decided to look after the data and analytics in Snowflake. He has an interesting presentation for us about mocks, fake, simulators, and, uh, and tests. Ladies and gentlemen, Kamil Vitecki, stop writing test doubles you are using. Kamil, the stage is yours. Thank you, Remigiusz. Thank you very much for this warm welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, before we start, I would like to ask you a question. How many of you have been to my presentation previously? Okay, few people. Thank you very much for coming back again. This gives me some kind of a feedback that you appreciated previous ones. And thank you all who came here for the first time for the trust you put in me and the title and abstract of my presentation. Uh, this year, I would like to tell you my opinion about creating mocks and how to approach this. The presentation will last around 40 minutes and at the end we'll have Q&A session. That means that if you have any question during the presentation, please don't ask it immediately. We'll have dedicated time for that. The reason for that is that I have been practicing, I have some kind of a flow, and if I start discussing with you, I might answer the question, but I will lose the flow. There is one exception to that rule. There is one mistake on the slides. If you spot it, you can shout it out immediately. So be careful and figure out where it is. And Magda, one of the organizers, told me yesterday not to make any dad jokes. I can't promise you that, but at least you have been warned. <laughs> okay. How it comes, I have decided to talk about mocks, testing, and so on, and why I consider this important. Why I want to tell you about this is, that's a story. I was in an interview some time ago, and I was asked, hey, Camille, if you were given a chance to design a perfect world, how you would like people to test their code in such condition? And I thought, you know what? I would like us to stop creating mocks of the dependencies we are using, but rather create a mock that others can use for my code and get the mock of other people. So the same people deliver production and mocking facilities that I depend on. And this is the reason I am here. I cannot change the world. The world is not perfect, but together we can make it a little bit better. Before we'll go to the details of the presentation, a few disclaimers. Presentation is intended for educational purposes only. 
The information and views are my own, not necessarily related or endorsed by anyone else. Institution, my employee Snowflake or Nokia, who is host of that conference, or any materials or person I will be referring to. This is all my own views and opinions. And my view is that when we are doing a software, we are going in some kind of a contract with other people. I am delivering a piece of code, you are delivering a piece of code, we want it to work together, and we are making some kind of a deal that my part will work this way, your part will work this way, we have some interface, and so on, and so on, and so on. Let's make that contract executable. Not a document, not a chit chat in a pantry that I want it to work this way. Let's make it executable. Let's make a test double that will be verifying that contract in each and every run so that we express the contract in the form of a test double. And then, if we think about small picture, my component, your component, things are simple. And, well, there is no harm in how we do things. If I am writing my code and mocking everything around, I am creating some number of mocks and that number must be there. If I look at the bigger picture, there is my component and it's used by 10 clients. If these 10 clients, each of them creates their own version of a mock, there will be 10 mocks. And if I provide them with mock of my component, then there is just one copy. And last but not least, this is about serving others with our vision and being served by them of how they understand things. So having an interlock of mutual understanding, not my assumptions and your assumptions, but mutual understanding and giving mine version of understanding things to you so that you can integrate with it early enough so that together we can shorten the time to market and increase quality of our life and our software. First of all, who is familiar with the term test double, mock, simulator, and so on? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, around half of the room raised the hand. That means that this part about mocks and so on, I will not skip it. I intended to do it if it would turn out that everybody is familiar with it. But let's do it. So, Test doubles, think about movies. In movies, you have stars, and the stars are high-paid people, but not necessarily stuntmen. If there is a risky sequence, usually the star is put aside, and a stuntman, a stunt double, is put in that role for a moment to do that risky thing. And this is the same concept we are using in testing. We have a component that we want to test, and it is interacting with some other pieces. We are testing a code that might not yet be production quality. It might fall short. And what if that component is interacting with banking systems and making transfers? Or shipment company creating labels and invoices? Or database of medical records? We wouldn't like to play with that during testing that might create quite a risk if we transfer money arbitrarily with each and every test run, or we tamper with the medical data. So instead of these components, instead of these dependencies, we will be using test doubles. The same concept as in movies. We take that component that is so important, we put it aside for a moment and put there something that more or less look alike, feels the same, but doesn't have this side effects that we want to avoid. And we have different types of test doubles, and I will be using these names throughout the presentation. One of them is a stub. A stub is as simple as it gets. It does nothing. You just throw something at it, it throws it back, no logic inside. Like a function add that is supposed to, num to add two numbers. If it is a stub, you throw two numbers at it, two plus two, four, six plus six. 4, 77 plus 99, 4, you see, there is no logic behind it, it just lets you move on and on and on, but the results it gives you, they might not be perfect. If you want something more complicated, something that can give you a logic, you might try to mock. Mocks are this 
tricky things that come with a list of expectations. Mocks are there, having the list, and expecting you to do things exactly this way. So you tell a mock, a mock looks like that original component, but you tell it, hey, dude, when a code is run, you shall expect that this happens, that is called, this happens after that, this is the order of events, and there might be some other action, but not necessarily in any order with the others. And then during the execution, the mock will be verifying it, step by step by step by step. Anything goes wrong, anything goes bananas, the mock will immediately tell you, hey, 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 this guy, it wasn't expected to do so. There are different approaches. Mocks can be strict, like fail immediately if any side effect is there, or they can be very relaxed guys. Okay, I didn't expect that call, but it's fine. But I expected that call to do something else, so okay, let's complain about this one. There are different approaches to that. My take on it, let's be strict. We want our code to do exactly what we planned. Not like, okay, maybe we want to do that transfer because nobody expected no transfer. Ooh. But you know, you can have your opinion about that and that's a topic for a different story. And then, there are spies, and spies are opposite of mocks. Spies are silent. They are in between your code and some other test double. They're just watching. And at the end, after the execution, you can ask spy, hey, what happened? Did the guy call this? Yep. Was it in that order? Yes. Have he called that at the end? No. All right, that's an error. So a spy does its thing at the end. It watches all the time, but you can inquire it at the end. And it is useful in scenarios like you are not sure, for example, how it goes. And you want to produce kind of a sequence diagram. So you put a spy between your code and a production code and just watch it. And after that, you ask, hey, what was called in what order? And you get a concrete scenario that you can go through and figure out how things worked. Last thing is a fake. Fake, it feels like real, it is more or less like real, but it's not the thing. It fakes, it simulates. It is something that is supposed to trick you in thinking that you are interacting with the real thing. The fake, when we have that database of medical records, you can, for example, have in your production system database in the cloud with millions of rows, very complex. You don't want to interact with it for a few reasons. First of all, medical records don't tamper with that. Uh, another thing, connectivity. Maybe you want to do tests in isolation. Another thing, maybe you want to run them in an environment that doesn't have access to production. You can replace it with a small SQLite. Something that you will have there with your code, with few records that are prefilled that you exactly know what's inside. And that will be your fake. It is still SQL database. It will feel like the original, but it will be something different. And this way you will have that simulator. You can then put a mock in front of that simulator or spy in front of that simulator to have some expect expectations and verification in place. So to wrap up the test doubles, we have stops, simple as it gets, throw something, get it back, mocks, long list of expectations verified during the runtime, spy, watching, and reporting at the end what happened, and last but not least, fakes, butter, margarine, who knows what it is. If it tastes the same, maybe it's good enough for our tests. Having said that, we can dwell deeper in why I want us all to change our approach to creating these test doubles. And first, we'll have an architecture take on the things and how it looks, what are the common pitfalls in understanding, uh, that or the pitfalls that I was guilty of. So in simple case, we have a component. And a component will have some interfaces it provides and some interfaces it consumes. And there will be somebody who defines the abstract interface. And all these groups of people, the consumers, producers, are the ones who define, might be separate people. They might have different understanding. There might be something lost in translation. So they need to reach common ground at some point. And these interfaces, the abstract interface, and then the concrete realization 
are contracts that we need to follow. And when we depend on something, when we consume interface, we still need to follow some dependency because there is an interface, there is some contract, and we want to be sure that on our end, we understand what we can depend on. So we are in a way following that contract from the different side, but it's the same thing, it's the same coin, just different side of it. We provide, we consume, or we define interfaces, and these are our contracts now. And what happens when you define a third-party mock, it is in small scale okay. So I am creating my system under test, I am creating a mock of my dependency, and so far so good. I can even make my tests pass. I will get green in Jenkins, or I will get thumbs up from somebody, everything works. The problem with that approach is that, in fact, what you are doing, you are awarding yourself a medal for understanding the interface from one and another side the same way. Because if you made some assumption that is wrong, you would make the same error in the mock and in your system under test. You see the pitfall here, I hope. So this is one reason why I would like to change it. So that when we do this, we get that certainty. We are so sure that my code is good. It passes all the tests. And so the production guys, they must have made a mistake. The problem is that if I misunderstood the contract, then my tests are not validating the contract that I really created, but the contract I understood, something got lost in translation. What an interface is, it's a contract, obviously, as I said, and that contract will have these three sets of people, providers, consumers, and the ones who define it. And so, that needs to be followed by the ones who provide and the ones who consume. So ideally, the ones who define the contract would be the ones to interpret it. They are the ones who know what was the intention. The providers and the consumers, they have some imagination about it, some understanding, but the original source of knowledge, original source of idea is the ones who define the interface. And the interface in particular is not an uh, interface between A and B, between two components. It is quite frequent, or at least in my life, I heard it quite frequently, somebody saying that, yeah, this is interface between mine component and your component. And that creates few different issues. First of all, one of them is that when I think like that, in the end, I am going to create strong coupling because I will talk to you and only you and I will think about your implementation and you will think about mine implementation and we'll end up creating an interface that actually doesn't cut things so cleanly it should. Interface is there to make sure that things at both ends of the interface are replaceable and if we replace something, it's indistinguishable from the previous thing. So if we talk too closely, we risk that we will create very tight dependency, that we'll rely not on the interface, but the implementation of other guy. And then one day, we might be introducing some other component that will be a consumer of that interface. And in that moment, it's no longer an interface between A and B, because we have seen the picture. So what do we do now? Oopsie! We made some assumptions and now introducing C is not possible because B was written in C++ and we depend on a memory model of C++ and the C guy, well, it's in Python, so it will be quite a problem now. That's why we need interface to be abstract, to be something that is not neither B nor A. And from the other side, could have thought, and I am guilty of this one, I am guilty big time, excuse me everyone who I have led this way, interface is not something that belongs to concrete component. Interface, somebody might say that this interface is provided by A, 
So this is an interface of A. It is quite natural to me to think in that category. And I have learned it's not true because of the very same reason. Dependency to internal implementation and introducing another component that will be replacing it. So I have a box that's, for example, a box, let's say it's kind of a router or whatever, that is having some interface exposed, and now I need to replace it with a newer version. And that newer version, it also needs to be an uh, indistinguishable replacement of the old thing. So it's no longer interface of A, because now I have a mock in testing or some a prime version, the new, better, more shiny thing that should feel the same but cannot because I made assumptions in the interface definition by following the idea that the interface belongs to the component that exposes it. So what happens when we get new clients and we follow the good old idea that if I have my piece of code and I have my dependencies, I should be mocking them. Well, let's imagine that I have my component here and it's having like 10 different dependencies. So in that small narrow scale, I will be creating 10 additional mocks for each of these components or 10 additional fakes, stuffs, whatever that will be. And so far, so good, things look okay. But as soon as my component gets new clients or any of these dependencies gets new clients, then we will be creating multiple copies of the same thing. So each and every client, each and every dependency will create another copy of a mock. So if I have 10 classes using my component, then I will end up in a big picture with one uh, with 10 different implementations. If I have 1,000 dependencies, then I will end up with 1,000 copies of the mock. Yes, somebody might talk to other people, hey, you already did that mock, can I copy it? The different thing is that with each and every copy, we might end up with creating different issues, different uh, errors or different misunderstandings. And what happens if we follow the other way? If we have the interface and we creating A provide others with mock, stop, fake, whatever else for our component, is that no matter how many clients we have, I might be creating mock for one group of people and fake for another group of people because they might have different uh, dependencies, they might have different idea of testing, that will be finite set of test doubles. That can be like, I don't know, two, three, four, with different flavors, maybe for different programming languages, it will be limited finite number. It will not scale indefinitely with each and every client, but it will be finite. And every time I make a mistake, because it will still happen. I am the one who provides the implementation, but I can be wrong. If I fix it in production code and in mock, everybody benefits. Everybody gets the new mock. If they didn't discover yet that there was something wrong, they will discover in very next test run, because they will use the newer version, and that newer version will tell them, hey guys, there was a change. Your code doesn't work anymore with changed code. This is another thing. And Yet another thing is on quite different level, on human level. Because when I was making this old way, then my tests were mine, so they must be right, and your production code is wrong. In that case, there is no disparity, because in both production scenario, we are using production code of group creating A and group creating B. And when we are going to testing, nothing changes. The A guys provided mock. So if we discover error here, we still need to go to these A guys and talk to them. So we don't antagonize each other based on test results. We need to be involved early and we need to discuss things together, hopefully reaching conclusions early enough. And it's time to share another story with you this is how I have come to that idea 
in general because I have told you that there was an interview when I got enlightened why I would like to do that and do this very gig but in the end there was a different story in the background that made me think this way we were cre I was working for Nokia for over 10 years in Nokia we were making boxes so these boxes the radio the system module in telecommunications they were very concrete things you really had something you could have touched and between these boxes you had to connect them with something so there was some kind of fiber and the situation was perfect when it comes to this kind of approach because this box was created by one group of people that box another group of people this interface this fiber and each and every layer on top of the fiber was defined by another group of people so some kind of a standardization forum perfect situation everybody is separate there is no i am having power because i do this implementation and interface no perfect separation box box interface an interface was detailed it was very very nice it was expressed as a document how often do you read documentation of your interfaces because myself i read it like once the whole document when i need to learn the interface in general and then from time to time i just consult that all oh, right oh yeah i can use that method and that's it that's how i use this documentation i never sit down and think oh yeah there was this interface i read two years ago that was nice lecture i will do it again i would rather read some fiction book this way not the interface and this happens very often or so i guess i'm not that weird that many of people many of us are not reading these documents every day or not following up each and every errata and doing diffs of the interface documents so we have the boxes we have the document that everybody read once and then just consulted excerpts and there were things that the creator the person that defines the interface left undefined on purpose because it was meant to be flexible so there were excerpts that this is going to be defined by vendor of that box for example addressing scheme there were some resources and the number of resources the type of resources it could have been different and the internal realization could have been different so the vendor was there to say we will be using it this this and that way and interpreting it this this and that way please follow and then they were releasing their document like an excerpt that plugs in into that document this will be our addressing scheme so there were one group of people they were defining the very shiny box that is going to have each and every functionality supported all good they did the box they integrated with the other guy everyone is happy it works then another group of people they were creating this small box very 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 tiny one it had like 10 16 resources so the guy said okay maybe in future there will be more let's use eight bits out of this 32 bits addressing scheme so eight less bits are something that we will be supporting okay so these guys got to the memo they did the implementation they tested it it worked in the end it was simple change so then another group of people came and they were going to produce some kind of a cost reduction box so something that is supposed to support everything but be cheaper so they were going to use cheaper components smaller fpga and so on and so on and they said yes we will be supporting everything here is our document plug it into that original document and we will be good these guys took the document and they read all right they are going to support everything after a few months the guys realized okay that's fpga it's botched it cannot handle all the possible addresses like if address is divisible by five that will not work for some reason it was crazy i don't remember what was the root cause but it just couldn't support addresses divisible by five so these guys released some kind of an er errata that nobody really read and then they finished they finished they were testing all the time against their test double they mock and finally this guy say hey we have the box and this guy say hey we have our box too so we are on time the demo for customer is next week so we have one week of integration everything works with the tests 
we're good. They were not. So they connect the thing and like one fifth of the resources doesn't come up. So the guys at that side are screaming and shouting, hey guys, what's going on? Your box doesn't work. And these guys are like, but we told you there is a document and they never read the document, but they are complaining that, yeah, yeah, but the document wasn't readable very well. You see, we could have all avoided that situation if the guys who created the original interface wouldn't create a document, it wouldn't be PDF, but it would be a test double, some kind of a fake, mock, whatever that would be. And in the places where they left that note that this is for a vendor to do a thing, the vendor wouldn't be providing an errata, the vendor would be providing a plugin that verifies the thing. So at the beginning, the things would be exactly the same in this story. These guys would release their plugin, that plugin would be telling that it accepts everything because that's what they promised initially. These guys would be testing and everything is exactly the same. But the day these guys realize that the thing doesn't go the way they want it, they would not release a document. They would release new version of plugin. And a new version of plugin, we just bump it up in our CI and we start verifying at that very moment against that new version. Is there an error? Yes, there is still an error. There is still something to do at that side about that change. But now we have detected it exactly when we need it, as soon as it is possible. This way, we could have saved time to market because we would have few months to mitigate the issue, to deal with it. Not one week just before a demo. And it would be more civil discussion because these guys would release and say, hey guys, sorry, we have new version, we discovered an error. They would find it out immediately, plug it in the CI. Yes, somebody will probably be upset about it, but at least they would see, okay, they released new version. They told us as soon as possible and it just doesn't work today, but let's do something about it. Maybe they can do something. Maybe we can do something. Let's talk but we have time to do that. There is no time pressure anymore. And this is where I would like to end the presentation. Thank you for your attention. I will just reiterate again that I want us to create our contracts so that they are executable. Create test doubles. Do this thing in a way that everyone can verify the contract, not by reading it, but by executing it in the CI loop. Take bigger picture into account. And if your bigger picture is a project that you do today, ship tomorrow and forget about it, don't overkill it. Go easy way. But if you are doing something that will be having some compatibility issues, something that will be getting extended or something that will be maintained for years, this is for you and this is for us. And last but not least, any change in the world needs to happen somewhere. And we can't force others, but we can show them exa an exa example. And I wish that at least some of you have believed me that this is the way to go in future and that we will show that we can change something for a better in our joint future. Thank you for your attention. It's now time for q and I'm Kamil Vitecki. If you would like to connect, after the speech, there is my email address, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I will be available and we can have a chat about anything, about the presentation, previous year presentations, or my hope before an espresso. That's also a good topic to chat. I'm all yours now. So if you have any questions, then raise your hand and me and my colleague will come to you and give you the microphone. So raise your hands if you have any questions to come in. Uh, hi, Camille. Uh, actually, it's two questions in one, I think, but uh, I think we have the time, uh, if you don't mind, of course. Um, so the first one is the example that you gave in the story was very high level. You were essentially, the example you gave was two complete systems talking to each other. 
and uh, what is the level of granularity that you would recommend that people use when making test doubles and implementations? So, for example, if I make a, I don't know, an operating system kernel, should I also provide a test double for that and simulate all the, um, all its behavior and bugs? And the second question, also kind of relating to that, is uh, aren't you afraid that creating test doubles which are bug compatible with the implementation might actually lead to the bugs remaining in the test doubles when they're removed from the implementation. Thanks. Uh, one by one, Daniel. Thank you for asking and thank you for coming because we discussed that you don't know if you will show up. So I see you made it. I appreciate it. Uh, first things first. Yeah, the granularity of testing, the granularity of test doubles. I would say that anything that you can say that it has single responsibility on a given level is a good unit for test. Often I have heard that unit testing is about testing single functions, and with that I don't agree. In my opinion, a unit is anything that is complete in a sense, that it serves some purpose. And on different levels, the purpose will be different. There will be a class that has very narrow purpose, but just one, there might be some system that has some purpose, but it has one. When it comes to operating system kernel, frankly, I don't know the answer. It's a very good question because it makes me think and I will not be able to answer right now. That's a good one. And the second question, I already forgot. Can you repeat, please? Uh, so you uh, you proposed making test doubles by the same people who make the implementation of a given module or, a, or unit or whatever we call it. Uh, so aren't you afraid that if we make those test doubles bug compatible with the implementation, mm -hmm. that the bugs will remain if the, in the test doubles even if they're removed from the implementation? All right. So we have a situation where. I have my production code and I have some kind of a test double, mock or whatever else. I change something in production and I forget to update the mock. Uh, that might happen, but then who is who would you go to when you dis detect the discrepancy? It doesn't now matter if the error is in the mock or the error is in production code, you always go to the same group of people. So from the perspective of communication, it simplifies things. Yes, there is a chance they might forget to update one thing. It might be a good case for a code review to check. OK, I am changing production code. Did I change the test doubles I am providing? Because we need some kind of a different mechanism to take care about things. And I don't believe we can just have one single silver bullet that cuts it all. In that case, I think that code review is something where to look for this discrepancies being introduced. So I have more like question uh, because you gave this example of radio and system module. So now if you early provide this mock so you, that you can execute some things there, right, to check if it works. But in the early stages, many of these functionalities are not there. So how do you want to execute them, like, in practice? That's a very good question. And I see in this approach a very nice speed up because the functionalities are not there on the system module side. And if I get the test double early enough, and test double in general, I believe, will be way easier to create than the product. So we can provide a test double that is verifying the initial assumptions early enough. So if I provide that test double early enough to colleagues on the other side of the interface, we can have that verification early and do some kind of a TDD, test-driven development. So we got already the expectations, and we are creating our code to follow the expectations to make sure that we fulfill that interface. Does it answer your question? Yeah, so we are like passing something that we know what's 
the expected answer and then that is how these guys from the other other module know it's okay okay exactly so you get it it doesn't work you change your code as long as it is needed so that it works with this test double uh, hey uh, this side again um, my question is, it, it wasn't said explicitly in my opinion, but would it be fair uh, to say that, or maybe why stop at uh, saying that you should provide test doubles? Uh, maybe, uh, or are you an advocate of, doing, of going a step further and saying document by test suit? So that's what I think uh, would be the conclusion to your uh, story time. Uh, if the interface, and not even the guys from the box one and box two team, but the guys who designed the interface, designed the tests for compatibility, that would have been avoided, and mm -hmm. the, then the test suit would be even more important than the documentation itself. So w mm -hmm. would you say you're an advocate of, of that as well, or what, what's your opinion? I'm with you. So in okay. my opinion, this is a concrete realization of the thing. Uh, an abstract concept is that document your code and your expectations by providing testing methods. This is an example how it can be done in practice and how doing it other way around doesn't scale. Okay, so I think that we don't have more questions. So thank you once again, Camille. It was a really, really nice presentation. And please be on stage because we have a gift for you. All right. Thank you, Eolo.